Frank Sinatra died last May, the world reacted to the loss of a legend. But for those who knew him, it was more profound. Friends who spent time in the saloons and studios with him knew there was more to Sinatra than just the icon. Journalist Pete Hamill crossed the bridge between fan and friend. He watched the tributes and read the obituaries and felt there was something missing. Why Sinatra Matters is his attempt to fill that gap. It is part tribute, part memoir, and part biography. I'm pleased to have a friend of this broadcast back at this table. Welcome back. Good to see Good you. Good to see you, pal. Good to see you. Uh, why does Sinatra matter? Um, there's a variety of reasons, but I think the most important one of all was the music. The music um, was unique and original. There was no such music until he showed up. A lot of us have forgotten that. Um, it, it, that music has been debased by its cheap imitators and so on, but uh, to have that music, which was a music of urban America, um, the music made by the gen last generation of immigrants to this country, it became the sound of a certain part of the United States and became then the sound of a lot of parts of the world. It was a city sound more than anything else. It was not... Um, Hank Williams, and it was not Bob Dylan. Yeah. It's different. Yeah. Uh, but it was at least as valuable. Um, it was a music that was unique to the century, too. I mean, that career could not have been possible in the 19th century. You couldn't have had that. You needed the technology to begin with. You needed the microphone, the recording studio, and the radio to make the career possible. When it comes to the music, do we say about Sinatra, there's no way he could have done it any better, that on the music, he gave it everything he had and more. He took it where it ought to be. I, I think he took it beyond where it was and to where it, where it is. Yeah. I mean, nobody, and that particular kind of music has been better. Yeah. Um, and I think that was the thing that mattered. His movie career was less important. Uh, although he had a great actor's sense of a song. He knew how to inhabit a song the way a great actor inhabits a role uh, or a character and makes it his own. I mean, Marlon Brando, Stanley Kowalski forever. Right, right. Uh, Sinatra is always that guy in the saloon at two in the morning who's uh, moving quarters around on the bar and trying to wa and wondering whether he can find a cab in the rain. That character, that urban character, is I think the thing that's a genius, the ingenious part of that music. You remember when you first met him? <clears throat> I met him in uh, 1963 after the f second Patterson Liston flight which lasted um, less than a minute, as I remember. Yeah, that's right. We all went back to the, we all went to the press room and wrote our stories, and we were free. And Jimmy Cannon, this great sports writer of that era, uh, said, come on, kid, he had a New York You were what? Thing. I was 28. I was a, uh, an, an extra sports writer. I was sent out as an extra guy to go out there. I wasn't writing a column. I wasn't doing anything. And they took me over to this table at the Sands, at which were... Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Joey Bishop, and Leo DeRocher. And the star of the table was Leo DeRocher. <laughs> Leo DeRocher had this absolute manic genius for obscenity. It yeah. was, he could do more compounds of words in the English language than anybody yeah. I ever heard yeah. before. And he had Sinatra falling down and everybody else at the table. And I, as a kid, I had the good sense to just shut up and listen. When you're sitting at that kind of table, don't say a word, just hang around. Mm -hmm. And so it was like one of those moments when you're a, a kid reporter, you say, this I will remember. But then he, then he, he got to know me better. He called me a couple of times. He, he, we talked about doing uh, his book at one point. And I chose not to do it, and I regret it to, to some extent. But To uh, this day? To this day, yeah. Why didn't you do it? I didn't do it because it was the height of Watergate. Um, Agnew had left office in disgrace, and although Sinatra didn't, you know, like uh, Richard Nixon, he really had affection for Agnew. And after Agnew left, Sinatra threw a big party in Palm Springs with all the hoi polloi of Palm Springs in attendance. And I thought, you know, there were some things I, I could never explain to my kids, and this might be one of them. Um, I wouldn't do that today. Uh, it's I, a very good lesson here. Yeah, I mean, you know, you're I, letting your sense of yeah. the moment and, and Agnoy yes. going against everything that you believe in. 
And, and it's and, only a small part of this man's <coughs> life. And it's a small marginal part. And you part. can write about that and put and it in context. I, and I, I, couldn't, I could write about that, but I couldn't write about all the things I might have learned from him had I sat down with him uh, in an extended way. And actually what he was doing for Agner was admirable. Yeah. You know, he came from that school that said you don't kick a man when yeah. he's down. He was celebrating loyally. You know, and I think... I think that was an admirable part about Sonata. And he stayed with him until he, I mean, he didn't he, just right cast him aside. I mean, Agnew died in Palm Springs, I guess. I'm not sure where he right. died, but, but they were friends for a yes, long time. For the rest of his life. You talked to him about writing the book. <laughs> and, and you said, listen, if we're going to write this book, we've got to talk about three women. Three things. Three things. We've got to talk about women. We've got to talk about the mob. And we've got to talk about uh, politics. Politics. Right. I said, politics, sure. Women, I loved them all. The mob, he said. He said, well, you know, if I write, talk about those guys, someone might come knocking at my door, <laughs> is what he said. And he he laughed with some embellishment. He laughed. And then a couple of days later, he called back and he said, uh, you know, I thought about it. He said, um, most of the guys I knew were dead and what the hell, let's talk about it. So that would have been interesting. That's a lost conversation. I never heard him talk about it, did he? I mean, in, in any interesting Only way? Only in general way. I mean, what he said to me was, look, uh, did I know these guys? Of course I knew these guys. Uh, I worked in saloons in the 30s and 40s. They were the old bootleggers who were now were doing legitimately what used to be illegitimate. Uh, and I saw them, and I'd say hello to them, and the checks cleared. He said, he said, if St. If Francis of Assisi worked in saloons, he'd have known the same guys. Yeah. There were no Nobel Prize winners there. Um, he kept knowing them because of Las Vegas, in my opinion, because a lot of them, the ones who were the cleanest, made the transition into Las Vegas. They stayed with gambling as the central part of what they did. Uh, I don't think Sinatra was the kind of guy who would have loved hanging around with a dope peddler. But that old bootlegger... Uh, saloon Las Vegas transition and almost all of them were the same kind of people uh, I think he liked them did they do anything for him beyond being you know no. using him as a kind of look we know Frank Sinatra no I mean he could do more for them than they could ever do for him they did not create his career. That's absurd. The, the, the Godfather thing is a the, joke. The Godfather thing is a wonderful myth. And Mario Puzo himself has described fiction as the art of retrospective falsification. Uh, it's a wonderful story. It just doesn't happen to be true as documentary. Uh, the truth about getting the, the, the Maggio parted from here to eternity is that um, his agents worked very hard. Ava Gardner offered to do a movie at the peak of her career for free for Harry Cohn at Columbia Pictures. And there was one great piece if, of luck. If they give this role to Sinatra, if they give the you role can have to me free for a big movie. Yeah, yeah. and Sinatra was doing the movie for $8,000 for eight weeks' work, which was, you know, okay if you were a mechanic, but not good, it was not big star money. And then there was one other great piece of luck. Eli Wallach was the other great contender for the part. He'd never done a movie, did a great screen test. But Ilya Kazan decided to use him in a play on Broadway. And so uh, Wallach pulled himself out, which left him with Sinatra on the eve of the beginning of principal photography, and he got the job. And it changed his life, there's no doubt about it that. It was come back. Uh, but that's a tedious story compared to the horse's sure. head lying at the foot of the bed. Ava Gardner, the love of his life? I think so. And I'll tell you why. The only time I ever met Ava Gardner, um, was in this city, in New York. A mutual friend who knew her brought me over and said, I'd like you to meet Ava Gardner, and she was glorious. She, she was this magnificent ru ruin, you know, sort of like the Coliseum. Uh, and she was drinking pretty hard. She had a little tiny dog and a rolled up newspaper, and the dog would yap, and she'd whack the dog, and then she'd drink some whiskey, and she uh, went on a little bit about Sinatra. Saying? Um, saying, ah, oh, that, you know, bad, she had a terrific bad mouth, uh, but affectionate bad mouth. But the place she was staying was Frank Sinatra's apartment at the Waldorf Astoria, and it had been 15 years since they were divorced. So all the way to the end, uh, Sinatra kept taking care of her when she was unemployable anymore because of alcohol and other problems. Uh, he made sure that she was not going to get in bad trouble. Why did they split up? 
I think they were the kind of people, um, and we all know people like that, who uh, have to split up because they'll destroy each other. They're like two scorpions in a bottle. You know, there's no way out unless you eat the other one. And one of us will never walk out of this alive. Yes, it's exactly <laughs> one of those things. So that they, they hurt each other, they damage each other, they beat each other up, and they change each other's lives. It's like Grail and Z uh, Zale and Graziano. <laughs> Nobody's <laughs> coming out of this. Ollie and Frazier. Yeah. Nobody's the same when yeah, it's after over. After this is over. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the immigrant experience, and, and in a sense, for Sinatra, was what? Well, how I central think, was it to who he was? I, I think it was central. Um, as an Italian-American growing up, born in 1915, so born um, when the most virulent anti-Italian anti, uh, thing was still in the land, only 15 years after the worst lynching in American history in New Orleans in 1891, uh, where the stereotypes of the organ grinder with the monkey and the Life with Luigi radio shows that came a little bit later of fractured English, stereotypes involving weakness, very much the Italian version of the stage Irishman or of Step and Fetch It. Um, for him to come along and deal with that, Harry James, for example, wanted him to change his name to Frankie Satin. And he said to me one time, he says, can you imagine Frankie Satin? I'd be playing cruise ships right now. <laughs> to insist that his name was Sinatra, to insist that uh, he was going to uh, changed the way people thought about Italian-Americans through his diction, which was impeccable on those songs, um, through the style that he presented himself with, uh, I think was crucial. The other two guys, of course, were Fiorello and Joe DiMaggio. Right. Did he deserve credit for the voice? I mean, or was it all what he learned to do with it in terms of voice control, in terms of phrasing, in terms of what it became? The voice was obviously there. Um, it was a violin that became a viola and ended up as a cello, I mean, yeah. but it was his. Right. But the phrasing came from Tommy Dorsey. There's no doubt about it. When you listen to the Dorsey Sinatra recordings, and there's a whole pile of them, um, Dorsey, since it was his band, always takes the first solo. Yeah. <laughs> and you can hear this seamless move into Sinatra's voice and the way Sinatra modulates his phrasing all the way through. Um, and you know that that's where it comes from, that beautiful, mellow, uh, Dorsey trombone mm -hmm. sound. He was great on, on ballads. It was later fleshed out and made mature when he met Nelson Riddle. And Riddle was able to help him, I think, the combination, to wring the sentimentality out of the, out of the music and to make it stoic. And to do that with lightness, not with, uh, not, the stoic doesn't have to be tough, but it has to be light. And I think that's where Riddle was very helpful. But it was Sinatra hearing it, he said, this has to be a certain way. And uh, he got it the way he wanted it to be. I'm a Fool to Love You was for Ava Gardner. Yes. About Ava Gardner. About Ava Gardner. You were at a bar, P.J. Clark's on 3rd Avenue. Jimmy. Jimmy Cannon is there. Danny Lovett. Jilly is there. Jilly, William B. William. They get into a, the great disc jockey. They get into a big argument about it's Fitzgerald or Hemingway, the greatest right. novelist of our time. Right. 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 And finally, I'm a fool to love you, fall in love with you. Uh, I'm a fool to want you. I'm a fool to want you. Comes uh, on the radio and no, I mean, Sinatra I'll, says, "Don't you have anything besides this uh, Italian kid, Danny?" And Danny says, "Let me go." And he fixes the jukebox, and Billy uh, Billy Holiday, oh, Holiday comes, comes on. on right. And she starts to sing, I'm a fool to want you. And Sinatra says, time to go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's two versions of it that he yeah. recorded, by the way. And you can see in the first one, the absolute, which is right in the middle of what was going on, the, the anxiety and the pain is in there. The other one's done seven years later, and he's over it. It's wonderful to hear the two versions of it. He's over it, but in, his, in the delivery, you know that it was worth it. No matter how much hell he went through, whatever that was, it was one of those things that made him more human in the So end. on the one hand, you've got the talent, you've got uh, the loyalty, you've got the sense of sort of, 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 of a man who, who epitomizes the immigrant experience. On the other hand, you've got some unsavory characters, and there's also the cruelty yes. that everybody writes about, right. which I never quite understood. 
Well, I think I, I acknowledge in this book that he, uh, he certainly was capable of monstrous behavior. Uh, I never saw it, and, but that doesn't mean it didn't exist. There were too many people who said that it does, that it, that it did. I think it was basically, remember, he's an only child, which is why he's such a great troubadour of loneliness. And the privacy that an only child has compared to what he does publicly is a tremendous conflict. In any public life, the need for privacy is, is overwhelming sometimes with people. And almost every beef that he got into with paparazzi and all the rest of it, or people in bars or in salons, was about privacy. People coming up and snapping photographs in his face or abusing him or trying to play gunfighter in a bar. You don't look so tough to me, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, he didn't handle it well, though. And he says to me in there that uh, if they were going to treat me like a dumb wop, then maybe that's what I would be in certain circumstances. Your favorite Sinatra song? I like Don't Worry About Me. <laughs> Why Sinatra Matters, Pete Hamill dedicated to, get this, Esther Newberg, agent extraordinaire. According to Mr. Hamill, she can make the rain go. It's for her because if I was in a foxhole and they were shooting at me, I want her watching my back. <laughs> we all need somebody. Thank you, pal. Thank great you. Great to see you. It's great. Why Sinatra Matters. Pete Hamill, thank you for joining us. See you next time.